Thank you. I, th I think you guys can, can you hear me? Do I need to turn the microphone on? No? No? OK. And uh, we can, I think it's so far, so I think it's, yeah, I think as long as it's good. Um, again, my name is Eric Silverman, uh, Cleveland Heights High class of 87. Uh, served for eight years on the school board in the 90s. Served on the library board for seven years. Now I'm back on the school board uh, with the Alumni Foundation for over 12 years now. Uh, so what we're going to do this evening, uh, the focal point is the high school and the two middle schools. Um, but I'm going to give you a real quick clip notes of a lot of the other post, other pre-war uh, buildings to give you a little bit of context. Um, I think it gives you an idea of sort of the design elements that were going into it. Um, and there, and it also because a lot of folks didn't see the first time we did this about three or four years ago. So I already had the PowerPoint queued up. So. Um, Can you turn on mic? Oh, then I will turn on the mic. OK. Let's turn this one on. All right. Now, is this better? Yeah? OK. Um, we have to go back to well over 100 years ago. And I think you folks are, if you're, if you're members of the Historical Society, you pretty much include in. Uh, I guess it's more for the folks at home. Uh, originally, Cleveland Heights would have been what we would call a, a borderland, borderland between the growing metro, metropolitan region of Cleveland and the uh, farther out east uh, farms. Uh, so it originally would have been very much a, a farming community uh, with very slow growth. So the first building we're going to have, obviously, is the old schoolhouse on Lee Road. Um, and we see it here in three different eras, uh, sort of uh, an archival photo. Uh, the 1960s, uh, after it had been sort of boarded up and was left, uh, it was just boarded up for years. And then we see Cleveland Heights did an excellent job uh, reno renovating it, and now it's the historical, uh, the historical society sort of focal point. Uh, when Cleveland Heights uh, School District left East Cleveland, because we were part of the township, uh, one of the first buildings built was what, was, what became was Lee Road School in, by George Hammond. Uh, then became uh, the high school for a number of years. It was the first Cleveland Heights High School. And then after um, the high school moved to what became Roosevelt, it became uh, the Board of Education building. Uh, and we can see here, i uh, use my fun pointer, um, here's the original structure and then the addition in the back. Great little building. But by the 1960s, we can see it was uh, definitely a little shop-worn. Uh, in the back of this photograph here, that's the back of Boulevard. And at one time on that site, you had Boulevard Elementary School, uh, Roosevelt Junior High, the Board of Education building, and a combined power plant as well. It, when the current board building was built in the 60s, it was then demolished and made into a track and field space for the Roosevelt because there, there really wasn't a lot of land on the site. So here's a couple more perspectives of the building. I believe these trees may be still on the site, but they're much larger. This is going to be from uh, the late, 40, or late 50s, probably late 1950s. Uh, the next George Hammond building would be the original Roxborough Elementary School. Uh, we see in the plat, the plat map here its location. Um, we see the original path for North Park Boulevard. Um, and this is very similar to general proportions and design, very similar to the uh, Board of Education building. And we'll come back to this in a little bit. I, I, my opinion is I believe that they actually built the current Roxborough around that structure, hollowed it out, and made it into the auditorium of the current building. Um, here's another uh, George Hammond building, a uh, Noble Road School. Um, and, here the, and this is from the 1930s. You can see in the background we have Noble School being built. Uh, here's the original building. And then this would have been the Noble Library. Uh, and another image of uh, the Noble School. Uh, and then in the, the ninth, in, the, in the teens, we see tremendous growth. You, everyone here is pretty familiar, I think. Uh, tremendous growth, and I got some numbers on that. Uh, where the community, what was really, I think, very, very fortunate and, and beneficial was that the city leadership, and, and particularly the schools, saw what was going to happen. They saw the suburbanization. They saw the growth, and they planned accordingly. Um, and they were actually anticipating that the population growth in Cleveland Heights would get to 100,000 people and a school system with 16,000 kids. So they, they were very, uh, they foreshadowed where the growth was going to be. They picked building sites. Uh, and, and pretty much the building, the, the building plan we had, excuse me, pretty much matched what they were envisioning. Uh, the first of these buildings would have been uh, the old Roosevelt Junior High, which was uh, Cleveland Heights High School, then became Roosevelt in 26. 
Um, Warner and Weeks was the art, were the architects. Uh, they have a phenomenal portfolio of structures in Cleveland and even Cleveland Heights. This is not one of their most uh, glamorous structures, very utilitarian. Um, one of the things we do have is I think it was probably the gentleman who was selling the photo class photographs because for some reason we have a whole collection of uh, photos of classes, the sports teams, and there's little pinholes in the corners and a little price number. So we, I think that this is probably some of the, they post a photograph and you, you would order a print. So for a number of different things we have these class photos. And I like to show the sequence because we have, uh, this is the 1940s, everyone's very prim and proper. Uh, they actually seem to be happy to have their photograph taken. Then it's 1950s, still very, not necessarily as prim and proper I suppose. Uh, but uh, this is a stand that usually uses the front stair steps at the at Roosevelt for the photograph. In the 60s, you can see the fashions and the haircuts are changing. And then by the 1970s, it seems the students, they really don't seem to want to have their photograph taken. So it, it's, it's this nice, interesting progression where we have very happy to be there to, can we get this over with? I want to go home. Um, and sometimes we have, there's some Monticello photographs where they were doing before Photoshop. Uh, some of the students were um, being very creative and silly in the photographs, so we were, they were trying to erase uh, lovely hand gestures as well. And then unfortunately we see Roosevelt's fate uh, was demolished. It's pretty much where the sort of the playground and some garden space is at Roosevelt, or at uh, Boulevard, uh, between the current building and the condominium development. Now this is going to be, this is from the, the school district's master plan in 1916 where they were charting uh, growth in the city. And you can see from this, even by 1916, a number of sections of the city were almost built out, uh, particularly uh, on Long Fairmount Boulevard, uh, tremendous amount of growth. The other thing you're gonna see too is between the Rockefeller Estate and the Severance Estate, uh, the city very much, the, the northern portion of the city where I grew up, really developing almost separately from the rest of the community. Um, and also I like to tell, remind people, that you know, Monticello Boulevard didn't cross the Metro Park. So this, this section of the city is going to be much more focused towards uh, uh, Euclid, Ave or Euclid Avenue and Neela Park. And this is the, the numbers I was talking about. These, were, these are from the 1916 master plan they were looking at. And you can see the housing growth during World War I, even during World War I and afterwards, 800, 1,000 housing units a year. Uh, I mean, that's a tremendous amount of growth year over year. So you're, you can anticipate through most of the 1920s, they're built, the community's building at least 1,000 housing units a year. And you, when you factor in our weather and building technologies as well, it's a tremendous amount of construction. Uh, and because of that, the school district was anticipating this tremendous, they, they, they saw the growth, so they had to expand. Because if they didn't, they were going to be swamped. And we can see here, when we look at the student enrollment, that in the span of just a few years, they went from 700 students to 2,500. So a tremendous amount of, of growth and activity. And they were anticipating that by 1940, they didn't foresee the depression, obviously, uh, 16,000 students and a population of 100,000 people. Uh, right now, the, com community, the combined communities have uh, 65,000 people. So it would have been a tremendous amount. And because of that, they had to plan accordingly. And this is one of the first buildings. This is going to be uh, Fairfax, which I believe is a Franz Warner building. I'm not sure for, not certain. Uh, this is Fairfax uh, built out. Very attractive structure. This would be a plat map. I think I, some of these are swiped from Mr. Tishnell, so my, my apologies for not the photo credit. Um, and this is going to give you a sense that this is Fairfax built out. And the next slide here, and this is a very, I always find this interesting, is what they would frequently do is they would build the front of the structure, and for some of the buildings that have a very large auditorium in the gymnasium, and then two years later, they build an addition, an addition, and an addition. Uh, pretty much from about 1915 to 1965, aside from the World War II and the Depression, they were either building a building, planning on building a building, have a bond issue on, or adding on, to a, adding on a wing. Constantly adding on structures, and even that wasn't enough. A lot of temporary structures we'll see in the photograph later. So this is going to be Fairfax uh, in the 1960s. The other thing too you'll see in some of these slides, we have a lot of ornamentation at the roof line. Uh, by the 1960s, it's gone. 
masonry failure, what have you. But it's sort of all I like to remind folks is when we look back at the, the unfortunate demolitions, that we, we, like, we, we a lot of times think of the buildings as they were brand new, tending to forget how worn down they would have been by the late 1960s. Here's another photograph of Fairfax. Uh, no doubt a bond issue on the ballot. And then this gives you a nice close up on some of the ornamental detail. Um, really nice design of the structures. Uh, Coventry, there's a few years back they closed an elementary school, caused some controversy. Wasn't the first time there was controversy regarding Coventry. Uh, this, had, this is a flyer opposing the construction of Coventry, uh, saying that I think, I don't know if you can read it or not, that the, uh, one of the neighbors had spent lavishly on her landscaping and how putting an elementary school next to it would, would diminish her property values. What's nice about it too is it, has you, it gives you photographs of, uh, you've got Roosevelt at the top, uh, with the, the duplexes behind it, uh, Roxborough with, again, the homes, and then Fairfax uh, just built. And what was really interesting, I thought, with uh, Coventry is it's a very awkward site. And a lot of the early sites were these very, some were scraps of land, and the architect, Franz Warner here, was very, very creative in the floor plan. So what you, again, you have, this is, the, this is the main building originally built, and then just a few years later, this is an addition and a wing. Um, the tower, which we'll see in the photograph in a minute, I always thought was some sort of mechanical component. And it was just ornamental, which again goes to the fact that they were, this era is very, very, very flamboyant, very creative in the uh, design. Here's the front door of Coventry, uh, close ups. This is, a, this is a, I love this photograph because it gives you a lot of different things. You've got the ornamental tower. Washington goes, all the, Washington goes all the way through to Coventry with the dinky, which was for the real estate development. It's before the library was built. And this little building back there, that's what they would call portables, what we would today call trailers, because the enrollment is constantly increasing. It's very easy for the, the school district to buy some money for a small wooden building as opposed to passing a bond issue. So these would have been, free. you'll see, we see these on plat maps all the time. Oxford, Canterbury, Fairfax, using the trailers until a bond issue is passed. Another great photograph of Coventry. This one shows you Coventry. Oh, I went too fast. This is, you got, here's the, you can see the freshness of the brick. And then I like this photograph because of the car. Um, this gives you the, an aerial perspective. So this would have been the addition. And one of, one of the things Warner did frequently is he'll have the main auditorium sort of up a half flight of stairs, and below it would be the gymnasium. Um, and a lot of these buildings had these fixed seat auditoriums. Uh, Taylor, Fairfax, Noble, 500 seat fixed seat auditoriums with stages. Very, very nice, very attractive. At the same time, when they were first built, there's only six or eight classrooms. So they pretty much, they were designing the main core of the infrastructure, and then two years later, three years later, they'd add on a wing. And then here we see the fate of, Co of Coventry School. Another Warner building, uh, Roxborough. I'm going through these quick because I want to get to the, the reason why we're here this evening. Uh, here's a nice contractor photograph. The key thing, again, I mentioned this stuff, how the ornamentation would be gone by the 60s. You're going to see in another photograph in a minute. Here's an architectural record. Now this is the 1960s. You can see a lot of the ornamentation here is gone. I like the little Nash over there. There's a cross section of the building. And here you have this really nice auditorium that was built in. And I'm going to show you a, a blueprint, which again, I don't have any definitive information, but my, my gut tells me that this is the original George Hammond building. They built this around it, and then they hollowed it out. And here's the this is, I guess, the proof, if you will, is that on the one blueprint we have, it said these, these are reading alterations and additions to Roxborough School, existing building, wraparound, and from a structural blueprint, it's basically a separate structure. And then here's another one of these great aerial photographs 
um, showing you the scale of the structures in relation to the rest of the neighborhood. You have all the shaker development that hasn't occurred yet. And then this would be two different eras of, uh, the, we have the wonderful 1970s where they removed the fixed seats. They went very, they had some fun with the paint colors. And then we have the 1990s when they're trying to restore some of the original detail. I have a slide that's missing. And then we have what the 19s, oh. Never, maybe, never mind. Forget. It shows up on mine, but you know, yours. Oh, oh, all right. Maybe not. Okay. Okay. Here we have my old car filling in for the Nash. Um, we have the, I'll be sarcastic and say, wonderful additions. Um, this, you'll see, we see this at many of the buildings in the 1970s. To a high degree, what was done at the built, in many of the elementary buildings would have been a very uh, basic, a lot of cosmetics, and then I think sort of to give everybody something. Hey, let's put the library in front of the key architectural detail of the building. Um, so 1920s is when we see this tremendous amount of growth, tremendous amount of expansion. Yeah, Franz Warner with uh, the original facade of Noble. And we see now a little bit more of a movement to a little bit less ornamentation in some of the structures. And what I found interesting, and this, this is again, I, until about three, four years ago, I assumed the whole building was built at once. We have, here's the, the original portion of the building, and then this addition built just a couple years later. This is by John Graham, who would have been a, the sort of the second major master architect for the district. Um, the other thing which I was surprised by, the original building. I would have assumed this was gone at a few years after they built the main building. That building, the small original school was there until the 1960s. So this is pretty much where that small pocket parking lot is for the library. Uh, cross section of the building. This really gives you an example of what Warner was doing, where you'd have this m beautiful auditorium, gymnasium, uh, really very efficient use of the space. The flip side is, from today's perspective, horribly non ADA compliant. These are, as much as these are great buildings, they're terrible to get around to, get around in these days. Uh, you wouldn't build something like this these days because of the number of floor plates which has actually been one of the challenges in regards to the high school project. And this also speaks to what I was saying before. This is the second floor at Noble of the original building. So you have only a handful of classrooms and with this giant auditorium because they were planning for the future. They were expecting to double or triple their enrollment in just a few years. And then this goes to one of the great things about this time period in that the addition matches. You, didn't know it was, you don't know it's an addition unless you look at the blueprints. Uh, here we have Noble in the 1930s, after the addition's been added on, uh, in the 1950s. And uh, I love this clipping. Um, when they put the addition on to Noble, the neighborhood and the PTA wanted the addition to match the current architecture. They didn't want something new, they wanted to match. Um, the other nice amusing part is it was costing them $200,000 for the addition. Uh, so, obviously, uh, prices have changed a little bit. Uh, and then this should be, this is Noble pretty much currently. Uh, Taylor Road School. This is uh, Franz Warner's sort of co conceptual drawing for the building. Very, very attractive. And what's interesting or really nice is that this is what was built. Um, pretty much matched his, his original vision and design. Um, again, another one of these buildings where this was a, a very centrally located structure, so they anticipated a lot of enrollment. Um, so this is the original building. And then this one we have, this is, a, I'm not a car guy, so this is probably in the 1940s. Um, and you can see they've added the additional wings on. So when Taylor was at its maximum, it would have been a, a huge building for elementary enrollment. A few more photographs of uh, the building over time. And another sad demolition photograph as well. Um, I remember looking over the 1972 bond issue was $19.5 million bond issue 40, 42 years ago. I believe the cost to renovate the four buildings that were demolished was about a half million dollars more. So I can't, I don't know the specifics of what they would have built, but it, it's still sort of, it's sad to think that we lost those four buildings for the sake of a half million dollars. 
The flip side is, had we retained those structures, they were so much larger than what was what to replace them, we probably would have been closing buildings constantly through the 70s and the 80s because we would have had far more extra capacity. Uh, Boulevard, I believe, is another uh, Franz Warner, but he's part of a larger group now. Uh, Boulevard was a very small building. Again, it's always interesting to see the cost for the building was $267,000. And this is going to be another one of these really heavily ornamented buildings. Great detail at the, at the roof line. Another contractor photograph. And these are some close-ups from an architectural journal. Um, again, like I was saying before, by the 1960s, however, a lot of the ornamentation's gone. It's, it's squared off. The buildings, they've lost a lot of that character and, and flavor they used to have. Uh, just, just a couple more. The, the Boulevard breezy bits, a uh, little student newspaper, so we can compare what uh, we, the building looked like in the 1920s to what it was in the 1960s. I think I only have a couple more elementary schools. Uh, Oxford, um, I'm a big fan. John Graham's architectural drawings, I, I love them, so I, I always like to show them off. Um, here again, Oxford, I always assumed the building was built at this, all at the same time because the addition was built only a couple years after. Uh, and of course, because of the World War II and the Depression, uh, all of those future additions didn't occur until you know, 20 years later. Oxford, now we're, we're seeing Oxford and Canterbury, much more conservative design, much, I don't want to say plain, but much more conservative, not as much embellishment. But they're still very pretty buildings, pretty, in my opinion, pretty buildings. Um, Oxford, like, uh, is one of our, and like Monticello, one of the least altered structures, I think, to a high degree. We, but we have some nice details, the front door, and of course, oh, here's a this drawing. Um, so you have nice ornamental front door detail work. And hopefully this will show up. And, and again, as we see at Roxborough and we see at Canterbury, if you, have a, if you have a pretty front door, the most important thing you should do is put a building that looks like a pizza hut right in front of the structure. Now, Canterbury, if somebody could explain to me, this is a side perspective of Canterbury. This is what we usually see, of, we think of as Canterbury. And Canterbury is very, very similar to Oxford in its general design. But if someone could explain to me, it was sort of they built two-thirds of the front, and then the future wing, if someone has any reason, I, I've never been able to figure this out. Um, it's very asymmetrical as far as what they built. A, a great contractor photograph, you should, I think the reason they shoot from this perspective is because if you look at head-on, it, it looks incomplete. Um, here we have some uh, 1950s photographs. So we have this addition, which is completely incongruent um, with Canterbury. And this is what Canterbury was notorious for these two trailers. Um, were there for years. Again, you got to keep in mind, Canterbury is right on the Cleveland Heights University Heights border. So what you have is what a lot of the, until you had Northwood Elementary School built, which again was, had a series of temporary structures as well, Canterbury would have been servicing large portions of University Heights until Belvoir and North were, were built. And so this one's in the back of the structure, this one's in the front of the building. And then this will show up. And now we have Canterbury has been, in my opinion, uh, the victim of numerous unattractive slights is a nice way for me to articulate it. Um, it it's, again, good bones of the building, but over time the additions have been sad. So now the meat and potato, oh, that, that gives you a little precursor because I think there's, there's relevancy in seeing uh, a lot of the design concepts because the junior highs were some of our la late, last buildings built. So here we have, the, uh, both of the junior highs were by, are from John Graham. Uh, this is the original site plan and design for um, Roxborough. One of the things I think this key to, this, this tells us a lot of things I think which is interesting. The first one is the original path of North Park. Part of the reason why North St. James has this little bump out over here is because North Park originally was much closer to the building and only, only later on was moved out, uh, giving it more of a field. The other thing is that this is not a big building. This is a very small school compared to the other junior highs. At the time, you've got uh, Roosevelt is this giant building. There's no Monticello yet. So this is sort of almost, a, if you will, a boutique junior high. And we see that a little bit. <coughs> In the floor plan, it's not a very big building. There's maybe, I think, 18 classrooms. Now, they were anticipating in both wings to add on to it, but it's a very small, very compact building. It uh, has a great auditorium. Um, I was, we had a board meeting last week, at, uh, or this week, 
forget what day of the week it is. Earlier this week, we had a meeting. We replaced all the seats in the two junior highs. Um, and what a difference it makes. So you have the, I'm looking forward to seeing what, my, what Roxborough looks like because it, these are these great auditoriums. Interesting little thing is, it was also the competition gym. So if you're playing on the junior high, the kids would sit in the auditorium and the games played on the, on the, in the auditorium, behind, the gym behind it. Um, again, very, very clever and creative use. Every nook and cranny is being used. So it's a very intelligent use of the space. Flip side is though, this building is, a, there's so many different floor plates. It's completely non-ADA compliant in our era because you've got these stairwells to the gyms, you've got different, again, because they're making the most use of the space, which is great. But by today's, for us, to, it's, this, this is gonna be a very challenging building to retain its character while bringing it up for 21st century when we get to the renovation project. Uh, this is a, I like this because it's got the, the Woody station wagon. Uh, 1940s image of, the, of Roxborough. What you'll, you'll see here too, we have these two small doorways which by I think the 1950s, because they need more space, those will be lost and converted over to classrooms. Here's more of a contractor photograph from the 1960s. Really nice windows. Uh, some architectural detailing. Um, much more, again, more reserved than the Warner structures, but still really nice looking buildings. And we've got these great photographs. Uh, Davis Cup was held for a number of years at the Roxborough's tennis courts. Or actually, the, the courts would be adjacent to it. So they would have it, you get these, you know, you can see the Cleveland skyline in the background. And then we have Roxborough today uh, with the consolidation of our, you, keep in mind our enrollment has gone from its peak to now we are about half of our peak enrollment. Uh, when we look at, we've closed elementary schools over time. We've moved the ninth grade to high school. We haven't really had any, since Roosevelt closed 40 years ago, we haven't had any changes. So part of the, the board's rationale was we, were, we didn't have enough students for, to justify three junior highs. It was beginning to, imp I'm sorry, middle schools. It was beginning to impact the ability for programming. So by going from three buildings to two, it allows us to have a, more, more programs accessible because you have enough, you have more kids for critical mass. Now this would be 1930, we're seeing that towards the, the end of the, the, build, build, the building boom. Um, this is an original design concept for, for Monticello, for, or design study, I should say. Then we have another one, which sort of looks like what was built, but uh, not completely. And then we have uh, Graham's final design. Uh, which took elements from both of those uh, design concepts. Um, my, in my opinion, Monticello is probably our best building square foot for square foot. Uh, very attractive structure. One of the ones that was least altered also in 72. Uh, so you look at the front of the building, it looks pretty similar to what it originally was built. Uh, this is the opening program for Monticello and you can see the floor plan. Um, pretty much what What's there is what was built in 72. A few modifications, the, they did, a, did this in a number of buildings. The courtyard was enclosed and made into a library. Uh, library was cut up and made into classrooms. Uh, and then the cafeteria was moved to the ground floor. This is something that happened at the high school as well. Uh, very, I don't want to say common practice, but something that they were doing was you took some of your most outmoded, outdated and, and outmoded spaces um, and replaced it, used the volume for something else. Um, so this, uh, in the 1970s, we have a large addition here with a new competition gym and the cafeteria. Uh, I would anticipate when we get to the, the, again, we're very, we've only seen a few very early design concepts for the two middle schools, um, but pretty much it was remove the additions, keep the historic core, and then come up with additions that would make sense uh, from a floor plate and, and design component. Here we have Monticello in the 1930s, or 1950s. We have the uh, nice tail fins. We have a large number of these great photographs of Monticello students about to go on field trips, uh, usually the Washington trip. So we have a whole, years and years of photographs like this. And then we have Monticello today. Um, the replacement windows, they're not perfect but there's such an improvement over what was there before. It's, uh, I believe, 
in the renovation plan, uh, these windows by that time will be 15 to 18 years old. The, I believe the intention is to replace these windows with new, even far greater energy efficiency. And I think we're going to definitely have them match what was there before, really bring back the, the character and flavor of the building. And then the high school, this would be the architect's design concept. Uh, if you've thought little at anything with the Alumni Foundation, I'm sure you've seen this photograph or this, this painting more than a few times. Uh, this is the front and the cross section of the high school. Um, so you can see the original design. What I was surprised by is folks, they don't realize this is what high school looks like. They think of it as a science wing. Uh, until they get in the, they don't realize what's behind it. Um, what's also interesting about this, when we look at the, in the back of the building in this cross section, um, this is one of two concepts. What, this would have been your base model, and the architects would have submitted an alternate. And the reason alternates were, we had a meeting the other day, we're talking about alternates. An alternate would be you go out to bid, you budget a million dollars, uh, and the alternates, if you can do it, hey, if, you can get a, if we can get these extra things on there for the same bid, that's great. Um, this is where the North Pool is or was, I should say, uh, and some health classrooms. There's a whole section of the building that's not in this drawing um, that was, and I, it was an add-on. Um, also, we always get the questions of why would you put a pool on the third floor of a building? Um, the guess is that at the time, there, the boiler room had these high-pressure boilers, which are actually, I think, like you'd find on a steamship. And the speculation is that these, build, these boilers might have been temperamental. So if you're going to have something that has the possibility of having a serious problem, a large body of water above it to contain an explosion, put out a fire, um, again, it's all speculation. This is you know, what, they, what they were thinking of 90-some uh, years ago. But it does make a little sense of why you'd put a pool on the third floor of a building. This is the front of the building, probably from the 1940s. Uh, let's get the ivy covered. One of the things we're hoping for with the design, I'll show you the some of the current design schematics, is to bring back this collegiate quadrangle look. Uh, this is actually a reproduction of the original site plan of the building. And what you can see, this is what was built in 1926. So we have the front of the building, auditorium, boys, girl, boys, and, gyms, gym, boy, and, boys and girls gyms, uh, and then the shop, shop class would have been right here. Uh, this ornamental gate, they never built that. Um, track and very, very, very basic track and field. The track, well, they had laid out the design for a, a much more formal stadium. And as I guess back in the 1920s, it's not any different from now, they had a bond issue, didn't pass. So there was no true track and field. There was never a real stadium until uh, I think Mr. Hosford donated uh, what was equivalent to $1.25 million, I think it was $100,000. He donated $100,000 in 1946, boom. We finally had a stadium by the 1950s. A um, couple of interior photographs, uh, the main hall, the one on the left, or one on the left is the main hallway. Uh, so if you've gone to concerts at the high school, here's the auditorium. This is the, was, was the main office right here. Uh, staircase, like the little bus there. Uh, and this is uh, the whole neighborhood south of the high school, right behind the Cedar Lee Theater. Um, the one thing that's missing that you'd see today, trees. This is the 1920s. It's all new construction. This is a high school. If you were across the street, I think that's, I don't know that's Tullamore, uh, but right across the street by Wendy's. I guess well, everyone knows where Wendy's is. Uh, this is Heights High, probably the 1950s. Now this is a really good aerial photograph, and uh, what I like about this is this is going to be 1930s, shows you the new addition, which until I got involved with this stuff, I always thought that was original. Again, building's built in 1926, they put a new wing on, and even when the wing was built, it wasn't even finished out. A lot of, the, at least two of the floors had these very large study halls. They had all the, hall, all the hallway doors were play, or built in place, but they didn't need the classrooms yet. So then a couple years later, they'd throw the walls up. Uh, we see not a very exciting east field. And here's our, our, our small amount of stands. Uh, so this is the 1930s. You get, we, do, we still have, we have the nice collegiate quadrangle, but very lacking, if you will, for athletic facilities. 
Um, and this is your parking lot, is uh, some cinders, and you pull your car up there. Uh, by the 1950s, much more finished, much more polished. We have the new stadium's been built. You can see it's later because the trees have really bloomed. It's 20 years later. Uh, we have the social room addition. So for those of you who've been to the high school, this had been built in 48 to 50. The ground level was a social hall, uh, win windows on one side, um, and then above it would have been two stories of classrooms. Then we have some uh, assorted photographs. We've got uh, some of the detail of the gyms in the back, the brickwork in the back, uh, the flagpole in the front of the building, and then some kids reading their yearbooks in front of the science wing. Um, this is the current layout of the building, and I've color-coded it for what was built, or what years, I guess. So you're going to have the white is the original 1926 building. Uh, this orange, pinkish color is 1930. The blue is 1948-50. Then the green is the, all the work that was done from 58 to 62. And then we have the career tech or voc ed wing built in 72. Uh, things that I think are a little interesting, little details, you're going to have this here where the band rooms are. That originally was a set of locker alcoves because they had, again, enrollment increasing. The kids have to have a locker to put their books somewhere. They built this, they just bumped out the wall, and they had banks of lockers. When they build do the renovation project in 62, they take that little courtyard, fill it in, make that the band rooms. Um, in reality, what they did in 58 to 62 wasn't really one construction project. First thing to keep in mind, the building's in, building's in use. It wasn't like what we're planning to do now. The building was in use all four years. So if I was one of those kids going, my father graduated in 62, I have no idea how you go to high school, how to a building when they're constantly doing construction. Go back a, a minute. It was also done in sort of layers. So what you have was, you have some infill projects here. You have the cafeteria in this wrap around here. And then you've got the science wing, which is in actuality three, project, three, three separate projects. The pool, the science wing, and the south gym. So we, here's a photograph of the courtyard all under construction. This gives you a good perspective. Uh, we have the, in the foreground is a pool, in the background is a south gym. Um, put a little side door. This is, using, you, you're using the building during construction. When we were talking to the architects about, um, hey, can we maybe, for the renovation project, can we do some work and have the kids in half the building when we're doing construction? They just rolled their eyes at the, even this, the, the liability prospect of doing a construction project like that. Uh, it's very challenging. It, it's, it, we don't have a big enough site to do it, basically. Here's another image showing you the South Pool, a little bit more construction. And this is the back of the building. One of the big issues we're talking about now, parking. Where are you going to park? Parking's, there, until 5862, this was the parking lot. It was just a patch of dirt in the back of the building. This, again, this is a, again speaking, this is where, the, for those of you who've been to the high school, this is where the cafeteria and cafeteria is. And part of the reason why there's that low hallway between the social room and the cafeteria is that that was a cloakroom. That was never designed to be a corridor. It was, again, compromising by doing layered additions. And then because those, those pictures are pretty blind and dry, uh, this is, again, the main auditorium at the high school went under, underwent a major renovation in the 1990s. Um, but even with that, now when we get more into it, this little bump out here and over here, terrible for acoustics. So what we're looking for, and hopefully in the renovation project we're undergoing now, is the more years of additions and alterations and grime, if you will, that's been added on, when we pull those things off, the, the basic core of what we had is actually better than all these alterations over time. And then here's another photograph of the auditorium. And then this coming up in a second, this is what people see of Heights High now. Um, and when we see that, we're like, what were they thinking? And I always say to folks, well, you've got to remember, this is 1958. Uh, Sputnik, space race. How do you say progress? Well, you put a, you put your pro if you're going to be progressive, you, show up, you put it front and center. We're, we're not alone like this. Lakewood did the same thing with their high school. And Shaker actually did the same thing. But you don't realize, the one thing Shaker did was ori their original alteration like this was a bit more blended in with the original design. And then over time, 
they've altered in a, they've altered and modified it that you really can't tell that it was an addition. If you go on Google Earth and or Bing and you a flyover, when you look at it from the air, you can see, oh yeah, you can tell what's new and what was original and what was an add-on. So this is not uncommon for an inner ring server to do something like this. Um, but what we're hoping for is this is, now I can give you, I guess, the teasers, if you will. This is the latest from the architects on the design concept for the high school. Um, what this is, this doesn't have the courtyard in, so that's why these stairs sort of just drop off. Um, what they're looking to do is completely remove the science wing, all those additions. Um, the windows, all new, replaced. Uh, this lintel will be returned. So the, the design concept is the interior front of the courtyard will match, will be completely renovated and restored to what the building originally was. Um, now one of the things you'll remember from the science wing is this brickwork under here is completely, whatever was there is gone. It's either it was torn off or it's under layers of, it's, it's destroyed. Um, what the architects are proposing right now, and I'll show you better in the site plan, is two L-shaped wraparounds. So sort of this here is new construction, this bump bound is new, and this is original. So the width of those main hallways will be bigger um, because it allows them to have larger classrooms. The educational concepts and structures they're going for is to have uh, bigger classrooms with more flexibility, um, which they were unable to do with their current structure and column layout. Um, but what's really nice, as you can see here, the detail for these stairwells is playing off of the front door. So the design is to have it match. And the, the L-shaped wraparounds, the exterior is to match exactly what has been covered. So unless you really know where you know the building, if you're standing on the east field or the football field and look at the high school, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference. Oh. I can say quite, yeah. The, you, well, yeah, with ADA, this building will be completely ADA compliant. Well, that, that's because the reality is these are not going to be, these are really your second, these are not going to be your primary access. The, the major, I'll show you in the late list, <coughs> the major main entrance for ADA access will be right next to the parking lot. So, so where, those, where do you handle those new cars at the very end? Mm -hmm. Well, this right here is the current exterior wall, um, where it would be. This, and then over here, you can see actually this little notch, this is where the, right here is where the science wing is. So whatever is there, or the original facade, is, is lost. It would, yeah. Right, yeah. I can. You just slice, you slice off the ends yeah. and attach the science wing. Okay, so right. this is bigger than it was. Right. So, oh, let me. so this is, you know, basically a little sliver of this is exposed, and the roof line is right about here. So, what we're going to basically, what you're going to see then is moving up here, and then this facade. That facade actually will be removing the wall, will be moved out. So this, this load-bearing wall will be retained, but it'll become a corridor wall. In the, I'll show you in the floor, in the, in the floor plans. Are really more decorative than they were. Yes, oh yeah. And then also, that whole area with the landscape, that's what they used to do. Well, it, it was in the, you had a, basically had a big collegiate quadrangle till 658, then they went heavy with concrete. We're going to go back to grass. I think the what will determine that will be budget. It seems awfully elaborate for high school, to put it that way. I don't know how it can be handled. This is, so this, yeah, before we had the, the layers of additions, this is the current building. What is gray is being demolished. So pretty much every addition plus some of the spaces. Now, East and West Gym. I like the old fire brick. I, I, it has a feel for nostalgia. I like it because it feels, I remember as a kid, my father taking me through high time when I was a little kid. I was like going up and down these ramps, I don't remember, in, in this, this, uh, this big gymnasium when they were selling off the wares of the schools. Um, 
as much as I have, a f I like them because I went to High Tai. It's a 1926 gym. It's it's borscht. It's it's terrible. That's going to be demolished. Um, the one thing I do, I'm disappointed by, but we can't do it because of the site plan, is the 1930s wing here, which nobody really understands as a wing, because it matches. Uh, that will be unfortunately we're going to have to sacrifice that. Um, but the science wing, everything else, every post 1926 edition is gone. Again, part of this, this creates those ADA issues because anyone who's been to the high school knows, you know, the science wing is dreadful. There's all these different floor plates because even if they, if they had adhered to the original floor plan, the original plan, you'd have had some issues. But every single wing of this building, they never even seem to try to address that kind of an issue. Uh, this is a, a more of a, maybe it doesn't show up that way. Uh, front perspective, which doesn't, it pixelates poorly, so I'll skip that. Um, this one pix pixelates a little poorly as well, but this is sort of a rear perspective from uh, Washington and Good North. What we have here is um, clock tower is your reference point, here's your auditorium. Um, this is your main east west hallway. This is new construction here. Here's your 1926 portion. Here's this L shaped wrap around. Uh, this would be cafeteria and library, uh, competition gym, uh, swimming pool, uh, auxiliary gym, high base space for career tech, and then sort of this is, this is these are very early drawings. This is these are your main entrance. Here from the park mile, I'll show you that in a second. And the design idea here is for the, um, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce the uh, clear story window. The idea here is because the building faces north, due to get a lot of natural light in the building, is to have this kind of arrangement bring all this natural light into the building. This also helps with uh, LED or uh, lead certification and environmental because it allows us to reduce our energy costs. This hopefully uh, doesn't show up that well. Um, this is the site plan. Uh, can you guys see this at all? For bad. Um, hopefully, we just, well, let me see if I get that. I'll skip this one. But basically, what ends up being the actuality is though, the building is going to be, sort of ooze out, of, if you will. Because we're removing all of this frontage, it's going to be moved to the, the rear of the structure. Um, parking, this is going to be made, we're looking at parking along this whole site here. So you're, basically, these are more ceremonial, these are more student access. Uh, aesthetic entrances. Your main entrance is going to be here next to parking. Right now, if you're a visitor to high school, if you don't get one of the handful of spaces, you are out of luck. The idea here is to have plenty of visitor parking, handicapped parking, right next to an ADA accessible doorway. That addresses an issue that's been plaguing us for years. This should be good. Okay, this one. This is your sort of basement level. This would be we have career tech classes, competition gym, auxiliary gym, natatorium, a high bay career tech space. The purple is a career tech program. Um, the idea with this is all of your, for those of you in the high tie or students, there's athletics all over the place, all over the building. This concentrates it all into one section at the ground level. So can you just show us the outline of the original building? Yes. So we can see Right here, this is, this is 1926, this is the addition. So basically we're, we're expanding it to the width of the classroom. That's the best way to put it. And that U-shape that is not part of that but there. This is the original structure, but it's basically your basement. It's unestimated because the site runs from high to low in this direction, which is why we have the ability for the space. Um, so this, we're not doing anything with this, um, but taking advantage of the change in slope so we can have a high base space at the same floor level <laughs> as the rest of the building. Um, but the idea being to have, again, um, <coughs> the, some of the career tech programs that have, this is a good visitor entrance, so you have parking on the side of the building. You come in for the cosmetology salon, you come inside the this is your ground floor. So if you've been to the high school, this is probably the space you've been most familiar with. This is right where, where the dot is. This wall here, right here, 
that is the exterior. So the exterior of the building becomes one half of the new corridor. The one on the side of the building. We have the main east-west corridor here. So we, basically this is your you park, you come in here. Of course, to your left. All of your administrative offices, one location. To the right, mini auditorium. Mini auditorium, where we have events like this, meetings, community events, uh, recitals, concerts, things like that, right next to the park. Main auditorium here, cafeteria, a library, all the music programs, all in one corridor. Uh, related career tech programs, audio, audio, visual, all those programs right next to the concert space. Uh, special education in the wing with a bus drop off right next to it. The idea with the going for the architects are is instead of having when a visitor comes to the building and they don't know where they're going, boom, they have one main entrance, they come in, easy much, much easier to get into, much easier to navigate. Second floor, again, this here is your new construction, wrapping around the 1926. And again, one of the key things I was very insistent about the architects was, if you're going to cover this, it's got to match. Because we told the public that we were going to restore and renovate the building, and you can't have a new, you know, you, you can't just do a little period. We have to make the 1926 court match. Um, you have the classroom wings, science classrooms, and this is new construction wrapping around the auditorium space. So it's a very tight and compact space. And then a concentration for lockers. So we have locker alcoves. And then the red is the administrative offices. So we have a concentr we have a concentration of the students at lock going to you know go to locker, right next to that are their administrative spaces. And then the third floor is a much smaller, uh, 1926 with the wraparounds and the space which was originally the cafeteria. Then it was a library, now it's a series of classrooms. This will become art classes. And the nice thing about that is it has light on both sides. Um, we may be able to put some skylights in there, I'm not sure about that yet. But the idea being natural light on both sides and try to do uh, glass partitions as much as possible as well. So a lot of natural light in that space. Um, those are, I think that's all of my, that's all of my slides. Um, so I can go back to anything, if anyone wants to see any slides, if you have questions, uh, anything like that, let me know. And I can hopefully answer the question. Yes, ma'am. They're going to concentrate all the administration in one area. How does that fit with the small schools? Small schools is dissolving. The idea basically is to, look, and it's sort of an evolving thing because we're going to be moving from the high school to Wiley and then back to the, the, the high tie again. I think the, the concept is to take the components of small schools that have been working, like the real college program, which is, has a connectivity with uh, John Carroll. Small schools will fade away if you return to a traditional high school, but we're going to try to uh, pull out the components that really are, are being successful. That's so small schools will go away. Uh, the specific of the structure, I believe, will probably end up with more of a you know, eight, uh, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th, as opposed to the small schools concept. But, that will be dissipating over time. Um, could you say what uh, some of the possibilities are for why we need four years? I would, I do that right now. I think we're probably, we got, Wiley will be used as the high school for two years, uh, and then it'll be swing space for the middle schools for two years. Uh, so, I think six years. Well, the only reason I said it is because, um, I have some ideas of what I can see as using the structure for. I mean, I, there's uses that we as a district could have for it. Um, I could see a number of uses for the city of University Heights. Um, but at this juncture, it's far too early for us to speculate. I mean, I've got, I shared some ideas with some members of city council. Hey, here's some ideas, but we're out there. There's extra years. There's a school. school, for well, the school. And, and we also, the, 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 we probably need to talk to our architects as well is that don't forget we have phase two, which is the elementary. So the question we would probably look at them is that, you know, do, should we use Canley or should we use Wiley as swing space for elementary schools? Because it could be that we have one or two, one or two schools use Wiley as swing space when we're renovating the elementary schools. I would say probably, I would say almost three to four years away from starting to have a conversation about what do we want to do with Wiley? Because 
it's quite conceivable we could be using Wiley as swing space for the next seven or eight years. Um, but I think probably in about three or four years, we're going to have to have a, a real serious conversation of let's start brainstorming ideas. I think the reality is most of those is contingent on my own funding. I can see a lot of great civic use for that. I can see John Carroll using it. I can see us using it. Um, but with all those things, it's dollars and cents. But I, I think I think Wiley will find a use for it without a, I, us or somebody else will find a use for it. It's just a matter of we're too far out to make a commitment in my opinion. And I can't, and to a degree, I can't find an institution, unless you have a, a real long-term plan, they're going to be difficult to make a commitment as well. Any other questions? But that, again, that was sort of, I, I, I'd like to do a little bit of history of the other buildings because it gives you the, the context. Um, for what we're planning to do for the two middle schools, again, it's probably, I would say, next, in this, once we begin work on the high school, come the first of the year, once the high school sort of goes from right now they're going to move into what they call design development. We have the schematic, which is what you saw this year. Design development is when we start to say, okay, what's the floor surface? What do the walls look like? What's the baseboards look like? What do the doors look like? That's the next part, which I'm very excited about. The architects are probably producing because I know why are you picking out this floor cover? Um, that's when we really put the, the skin on the building. Um, then once that gets to, once that's finished, the district will start focusing on the middle schools. Basically, I'll turn the process of people, okay, who do we hire as architects? Do an RFP, hire the architects, then design all those design meetings and what have you. What are we doing with Monticello and Roxborough? So expect probably middle to the latter part of next year, the same thing we did for the high schools, we did for the middle schools. So if I mean, you like to some, some meetings and working on little Lego exercises, definitely come with those next year. Um, so probably in about a year, a year and a half, we'll have the same kind of thing for the middle schools. Um, because as soon as the high school's done, we turn around and start working on the middle schools. The one thing I would encourage you, if you have, uh, we should have some school board meetings coming up, if you have any passion or concerns about what we're going to be doing with the interior of the building from an architectural and historical standpoint, uh, make sure the board of ed knows what your thoughts are. Um, a lot of the, the only real finishes left in the building interior of the high school now, because we've done some tours on the structure, uh, is really the tile floors, tile baseboards, some of the doors. And unfortunately, whatever they didn't remove in 58, 62, they got to in 72. So there's very little of the real original flavor and character. The one is, is those floors and the, and the lace board. So I'm, I'm really pushing the architects where possible to, re to retain those. And then wherever we do new construction, at least in the 1926 portion of the adjacent of the building, that we invoke that original flavor. So when you come, if you come in, it's going to have that floor and the doors. It's going to feel like you're in 1926, but it's brand new. So uh, I would encourage you to uh, make sure that my colleagues on the school board and the architects uh, hear that if you if you share that concern. So, yeah. Yes. Um, it, this must be just about impossible, but what are your projections for enrollment going forward? We we pretty much the enrollment we because we're always having to do a 10 year forecast. We're looking at a pretty stable enrollment pattern. The one nice thing, which one of the key things with the design, because the architects are very big on this, is flexibility. In so much as that we anticipate and know technology, buildings, teaching methodologies are going to change. So the key component is the ability that it's not a heavy duty load bearing wall. That it's, if we need to move up walls over time, we have that flexibility. Um, we're also, this design allows us, we're anticipating we should be able to, one of the key things, I'll go back a slide. Let's go to this one. One of the things you have is these spaces here, which is, you can't really, it's like called, I think it's like a teacher's lab. Right now, if you're a teacher, uh, I'll use a teacher, uh, Ms. Russo. Ms. Russo was a history teacher. Or I'll go with Dave DiCarlo, because I like Dave DiCarlo. Dave DiCarlo was, he's my favorite teacher. Uh, Dave DiCarlo had a class. It was Dave DiCarlo's classroom. Now, if you've got an eight period day, well, Dave's gonna go to lunch at least one of those eight periods. And then there's maybe, he only has, let's say, five classes during the semester. So that theoretically, his classroom would sit vacant three periods a day, which is not very efficient. 
what we do now with this concept, that, that's more of like a, a high school concept. A college, professor has his, his, his uh, office, and then he has classrooms wherever, wherever during the day. What this allows us with that larger teacher lab space, the teachers now have a combined office space, and a classroom is just a classroom. The idea being that this allows us to have a higher utilization rate, so theoretically that classroom could be used or a seven, peri seven periods a day versus the only one that teachers in the classroom. That should give us the ability to increase, we're at about a, I think like a 75 or 80% capacity. So theoretically, we could have a bump up of enrollment that we could then deal with it. Conversely, uh, this is pretty much where what the Ohio School Facilities Commission, uh, this is what square footage wise, we are where they recommend spare for things they don't like, like an auditorium with fixed seats, like a natatorium. So the only areas that we're really over compared to what they recommend for our population is in spaces that we, ve we value as a community. Um, but otherwise, we're pretty much right on the money. So we're, we're, we're good for either a decline or an increase. We're comfortable. So any other? So, so. Well, thank you very much for listening to me drone on about this. So.